of this. Hey everyone, today is Thursday, March 25th, 2021. I'm Tara, welcome to A Loop Through A Loop. I'm so glad we're hanging out again together. It's been a busy month and the blossoms are starting to pop up and out on our trees outside our bedroom window. And I'm so excited for spring. And I know that I'm not the only one. There are lots of us that are ready for nice weather, I'm tired of the cold. So I'm gonna jump right in to what I'm wearing because I finally finished my fingering weight version of Blue Christmas. And I wanna talk about it with you just really quick and sweet. I don't wanna take up too much of our time on this. So I had originally knit this version, which is an Aran weight out of Lion Brand, Lion Brand, Lion's Brand, Lion Brand Fisherman's Wool. This is great for going outside, uh, but it's a little too warm for in the house. And if I want to lounge about inside, I needed something that was lighter weight and a little more breathable. So this is 100% wool. And I talked more about this at length in my December 2020 episode. I think it was the December 2021 um, so I'm not going to hash out all of the details again. You can check out that podcast. I think it might be four or five. I don't know. You'll know which one it is because I'm wearing this in the, um, picture for the video. And then I knit the same exact, um, design, but in a fingering weight cotton blend and this is knit i have both ball bands even though both they look the same <laughs> but this is knit in knit picks comfy fingering weight yarn it is 75 percent cotton 25 percent acrylic it is um washable and dryable in the machine you know you just have to wash it cold tumble dry it um, I just gave it a really good iron. So I do this with almost every single thing that I knit. And I say almost because I'm going to talk about a couple. I'm going to talk about something that I'm working on right now that I would be like, mm, probably not going to iron that. Um, I get um, an old t-shirt that I don't wear anymore. I turn my iron on so that it will get me some steam. And then I put my knit down on my board, put the um, t-shirt over that, then put the iron over that. And so far it's been fine. Um, and if something happens where that becomes not an option anymore, then I'll change the way I do it. But for right now it works. So that's what I go with. Um, and I tried to stick with similar colors to my original version. Um, but these are a little, darker than the original, a little more saturated. And I really like how this turned out. Since this is um, cotton yarn from Knit Picks, price wise, it was pretty friendly. I felt comfortable paying for it. I bought eight skeins, uh, four in each color. I ended up having um, one skein of blue left over and some of, I have them right here. So this is what I had left over of the blue. So one whole skein and approximately half of another and almost a full skein of the cream. The reason I had this much left over is because, I'm gonna shove this back in here. In my original sweater from under the arm to the bottom of the hem was 15 inches. And for this fingering weight version, I did 13 inches. So I have two inches less of knitting and so I still have quite a bit of yarn, but I put it in my blue and cream drawer, which is perfect because I'm gonna 
eventually get around to the yarn that's in here and kind of play around with making something. I don't know what that something is. That's going to be strictly for play. Um, so this version, it still has the split hem. It has all of the same details as the Aran weight version, uh, but it's just in a cotton lighter weight yarn. So I do have the pattern written up. I have the pictures on there. I'm gonna go through this really quickly because I am going to open an invitation to anybody that would be interested in testing. And I will put some information in the information box down below if this is something you would be interested in testing. Um, my guidelines uh, or expectations, um, I think right now I just have two firm expectations for testing the pattern. Um, I'll throw in a third. Um, one, you must knit the sweater that you would want to wear. So a lot of what I have in here, as far as um, like an arm length or the body length, those are recommendations. Ultimately, I would want, if someone was going to follow my pattern, I want them to end up with a sweater they love. That might be the sweater that I wrote in the pattern, or maybe they have to modify it. And if that's the case, then so be it. So one, it has to be a sweater that you're going to end up loving and would want to wear. Um, the other one, oh, it's like I just flat out forgot them. I gave this a good solid thought earlier today. Oh. Two, if you're going to test it, please be very honest and also very kind. <laughs> this is my first attempt at doing anything. I shouldn't say that because I have the blanket pattern, but this is my first garment pattern that I've ever written. And so I'm sure there are mistakes. Um, I'm mostly nervous just about the math and I've spent, um, a lot of intimate time with those numbers <laughs> and I think that it can all work out just fine um, but I do need testers to make sure the math works out well that's not true that's what a tech editor or a grader does I want to see do people actually want to knit this and does it get them the sweater that they want is what I want to know from testers but anyway just be honest, but be kind. Kind of like Mary Poppins. Very firm, but kind. And there was a third one, and now I don't remember what it was. So must not have been a very important expectation. But so those are my two expectations. Knit the sweater you love, be honest and kind. So I'm just going to walk through what's in the pattern first to see, is this even something that you would want to test? Because I know for me, I'm not a very good test knitter because one, I always end up wanting to modify something and changing something in the end. Some designers are okay with that and some designers don't like that. Um, and I don't want people to end up feeling restricted because that's sometimes how I feel like if I think about a test knit, like I have to do it a certain way and then I end up not enjoying the knit. And that is not the whole point of this. So for me, that's my opinion, that's my philosophy and my belief is that this should be for joy. So I'm gonna go through the pages of the pattern really quickly to see is this something that you would be interested in doing and like I said, after I get done with this, I will put some information about how you can contact me if you're interested in testing this sweater. So the pages are going to start with just kind of the details page at the bottom. I have written what the kind of the main idea of that whole page is about. So this is kind of like your information that you would want to know. And let me get my pages ready. Here's numbers. So hopefully my math is right. And as a former educator, <laughs> I like a good worksheet. 
And so I have one page that's dedicated for you to write down all the information you want to know about your yarn, your measurements, and if you need to kind of calculate some stuff, there is um, some room for that. And I do have a little um, kind of schematic drawn out so when I talk about a certain measurement, you can see what the measurement actually entails. And then it gets into the directions. The directions are only two pages long. I'm not gonna flash those up just because. And then in the end, just kind of like an ending page. So it's pretty short and sweet. I tried not to put too much information that you don't need to know, but kind of everything that I know that I need in a pattern. I don't know. I don't know. Um, and let me think, is there anything else I need you to know? So here you can see where it says video link. So in the pattern, even if I go to the worksheet page where you do your numbers, there is a highlighted link. So if you have this pattern pulled up on your computer or device, you should be able to click on any of the highlighted yellow links and it will take you to a video that I made specifically for this pattern just to show you how I did things um, to kind of walk you through it in case I did not write something um, clearly and also maybe you're kind of like I am where you can read it and kind of get the idea but you really actually learn best by watching somebody what they did so I have you know I wrote down what I did but I also have a video showing you all the steps I tried to put on my educator hat and like um think if I was knitting this, what are some possible questions I could have? And then try to make sure that the pattern and the videos that accompany the pattern could kind of answer those questions as you go to make things a little easier. But that's the pattern. And like I said, I'll have more information down below. So that's that. This is very comfortable. I like the way it looks. Cost effective with my Knit Picks cotton yarn, but I do feel like the color choices and like our side detail and the little details of the exposed um, seam at the shoulders, it kind of gives me maybe a higher end, I mean, I could only hope, like a higher end Ralph Lauren look and of course I love a pop collar so that's that we are going to go ahead and jump into FOs there was quite a bit quite a bit a lot of sewing this month so let's get into it for March week one we have three finished projects I did make another drawstring bag this time um, with a little bit more coordinating fabrics and these I got in the remnant clearance section at Hobby Lobby so I think somebody probably used these three fabrics together probably in their own quilt and then there was just remnants left on the fabric bolt and then I was lucky enough to come on the right time and scoop up their extras. So I have my next project lurking in there. And I used my School of Sewing book so that I could remember all the steps. So there's not much to say about this. It's exactly like the other bag. I use the same instructions. I have been playing around with um, 
the width and length of the fabrics, like just seeing how changing an inch here or an inch there modifies the size of the bag. But other than that, it's the same basic construction, just playing around with different measurements. Then I made another, a second bag, or I guess technically a third bag, still just remnant clearance fabric at the store, whatever I could find. And it has lining inside and I have a sweater in here. So it's big enough to fit a sweater, a fingering weight sweater, but I can't necessarily close it all the way because it's pretty full. And what's exciting about this bag is I decided to add a zipper. I, this is my first zipper ever in my life. And it turned out so nice. I was kind of proud of me. For being a novice sewer, all I did was follow Shay's instructions in her book on how to put in this kind of a pocket uh, that I think the tutorial is like with a purse project, but you can use the same idea for anything. So I'm really glad I did this because I can put stitch markers or a cabling needle, um, really like a tape measure. You could put little things in here. This could be the little notions pocket. And I loved the, this so much having the zipper in it that I wish I would have done the same for this. Cause I had tons, I had more than enough fabric to make that into a bag that had a zipper. And I guess I could go back and I could pick out the stitches and then put the zipper into it, but I, that's probably not gonna happen. I'll just, I'll just make another bag. <laughs> I don't think I have enough of that fabric to make another bag, uh, but now I know for next time. So what I'm doing as I make each bag, I'm collecting more like tools and techniques that I'm trying to learn as I go keep going. So with the first bag that I made that was like out of a hodgepodge of any fabric I could find, I just wanted to know how to make the bag. For the second bag, I wanted to play around with adjusting the size of the fabric to play around with the size of the bag. How, how does manipulating the width and length modify the size of the bag? <clears throat> and then for this one, I did add in this detail right here, this trim, and I didn't do a very good job because it's coming out, but um, this is the same trim that's used in the pillowcase pattern. So that's kind of something I already knew. I just wanted something to break up these two patterns because they kind of clash, right? So I wanted something to kind of separate them, but still ties them together and the yellow worked. I don't know. I like things that don't necessarily match or go. To me, this is like a traveler bag. Like you've been all different kinds of places. Everything's not going to match perfectly. Anyway, um, and then for this bag, I wanted to like learn how to make a zipper or how to put the zipper in there because I want to eventually make like my dream project bag. And before I can touch that, I need to kind of go on a treasure hunt of tips, techniques, and find things that I want to put in that bag. So that's what I'm doing there. Um, the last finished object that I have is a hat that has a little bit of dog hair. If it's not my hair, it's a little bit of the dog's hair. So, and it's black and our dog is white. So there you go. So I finished the Odette hat or the Odile hat. I think it turned out, oops, put it on my head straight. Um, I think it turned out very nice, very lovely. Um, I can, it fits, it fits really nice. But what's funny is 
I can tell on this hat specifically, not so much on the other hats that I made, but on this hat, when I got down to that ribbing, like my hands just hurt so much. Like I had, I was stressed out and I can't even tell you why. And I don't even know that I had a good reason for the stress that I was feeling, but my tension got tighter at the ribbing and my hands ached. I was so glad to be done with this. Um, part of my tension and tight knitting could have just been, it's black yarn. So it's more difficult to see. And with the kids running around and I don't really have great lighting where I knit in the kitchen when I'm downstairs with the kids. And so it's not, um, it's not impossible to do, uh, but it's not like, it's not the best for black yarn, you know, but if I hold it up like this, you can see the stitch definition pretty clearly. I think I like the mix of cabling and lace. I like the traditional ornamental look. So that's something I've learned on my knitting journey. Um, it's very fascinating to me to find out what I'm drawn to. And I've just decided that there are a bajillion new patterns that come out. I mean, every day, right? It seems like if you go on to Ravelry, there are tons and tons of new patterns out all the time. And there are designers that I love but I'm trying to practice the exercise of not purchasing a pattern until it's time to make it because I have in the past, like with Andrea Mowry, I have tons of her patterns. I like her style of knitwear that she designs. I feel like I can take what she has designed and fit it into my wardrobe very easily. It feels handmade, but not necessarily like homemade. My great aunt Girdle made this for me. You know what I mean? Um, and the way that her pattern, I like the way her patterns fit my body. And with other designers, I really like their designs, but I've learned that they don't really, their designs don't really fit my body. And so then that becomes another exercise in learning how to knit to fit my body. So anyway, I don't see very many hats like this. There are some, I have found some on Ravelry, but I don't see very many hats like this out there. And this is what I really wanted. And this is what I really like and what I'm really drawn to. And no one else could have made this, but me, like I could have been searching on Ravelry for years and never found the hat pattern that I was looking for. So I just, you just got to make it right. So that's what I did. I might send this off. I need to mail out my sister-in-law's socks like any day now I need to get that done. I think she might like this hat. So I might send this off to her since I already have a boatload of hats. So this is all I was able to finish, but I did make way in some other longer term projects. So it's all good. That's week one. Okay, so the second week of March is wrapping up. And I have a few things that I was able to complete. I did use my Japanese stitch Bible to make another Odette hat. So this is the second one. This is the first one that I made. And this one, I just used the book and made up the decreases for the crown of the hat as I went. And for the second one, I used stitch fiddle so that my decreases were more purposeful and a little more thoughtful. 
And then I also did the folded brim of the hat. So these hats, they're more like fraternal twins instead of identical twins. Um, so yeah, and I don't wet block my hats. I just put them on and let my hat, my head kind of do everything. Um, the second one is, is it a bit longer? I haven't actually compared these side by side. Oh dear. There he is again. No, nope, they're the same length, same length. So what I wanted to do since I was writing up a pattern for the Odette hat, I wanted to be able to film a couple of the things to put into the pattern. For me, my learning style is it's easier for me to see what's being done rather than to just assume what's being done. So I would rather just put in a video that says, hey, here's what the pattern says. Here's how I did it. So that is Odette's audition take two. <laughs> and like I said, all of my knitting um, motifs from the Japanese with Japanese stitches comes from this book. Then I went on to sewing. I purchased this skirt pattern from Made by Ray called the Clio skirt. Simple, classic, A-line skirt. It has pockets. The front of the skirt is flat and then in the back there's elastic. So I have several to show you. So what happened when I was making these is somebody in one of my recent videos had said, have you checked out Ruby Moss Cottage? And I was like, you know, I don't think I have, but I think I've heard her mentioned many times. So I tuned in to Joyce and I was hooked and she kept talking about Anne with an E and Anne of Green Gables is my all time favorite book. And I super love like the 1980s Canadian movie with Megan Fellows as Anne. And I used to watch whenever PBS would show like an Anne marathon on the weekends, I was there for it all the time. So I was like, so I was watching Joyce and she talked about Anne with an E and I was kind of like, you know, I tried to watch that when it first came out on Netflix and I was, I'm so tied to Ellen Montgomery's words in her book. And then the movie from the eighties that I was just like, I was like, oh, I can't watch this. this is nothing like what she wrote. So then I kept watching Joyce and she kept mentioning it and her make along and other people were mentioning it and I thought maybe I, I'm going to, I'm going to give it another go this time going into watching the series. I know that it's not going to be like the book, but it will have the same spirit of the book because I believe that when Ellen Montgomery wrote Anne of Green Gables, it had forward thinking in it and was very forward thinking you know, in that time. And so I was like, just open your mind. You know, it's not like the book. Things have been changed. It's all good. Just watch it. Oh, and I fell in love with it and I marathoned all three seasons. And then I was devastated when I got to the end of season three. So what I would do is when it was time for me to sew, I would turn Netflix on my phone and have that playing while I was sewing in the background. And I got a lot of sewing done. <laughs> So I'm just going to go through these skirts in the order that I made them. The black and white version is my mock-up. So this was scrap fabric for my daughter's tree skirt. And this was remnant clearance fabric that I found. And I just decided to put them together because since this was my mock-up, it didn't matter if it went. Um, it didn't matter if it looked like a hodgepodge and the inside fabric for my pocket is also different just i think this was like a fat quarter i've had for literally over 10 years so 
you can see we have the flat front, the elastic in the back, so it always fits. It's an A-line shape. So for me, an A-line is, I know an A-line works. I don't have to think about it. It's like putting on your favorite pair of pants and just fits. I'm not gonna say jeans because I secretly hate jeans. I actually secretly hate pants because pants um, are always either too short or the waistband to hip ratio is off or if it fits in my waist and it's too tight in my thighs because it's based off of standard sizes and I mean I've never met a standard sized body but anyway I know an A-line skirt always fits always fits so what sold me on this pattern is the fact that it has pockets Every woman should have pockets. Okay, so this was skirt number one, my mock up, and I'm gonna still wear it. Um, in the pattern, this front panel is longer than the back panel, um, and I literally just followed this. To the pattern because it was the first one I'd ever made and so I just needed to test out just be a good student and do what the pattern told me to um, my second skirt is in this floral fabric and the design and colors of the fabric remind me of Mary Blair who was an artist that worked for Disney she did she worked on Cinderella um, Alice in Wonderland and she worked on It's a Small World and I just liked how she played with color. Again, pockets. This time I did not change the fabric. The pocket fabric is actually the same. And I think again with this one, I just followed the directions exactly how they were written. There were some techniques and things that I needed to be better at and keep practicing like putting the elastic in the back and sewing that down so for my second skirt I just wanted to practice the things that were tricky for me with skirt number one then skirt number three this kind of reminds me a little bit of anthropology like I'm not really an animal print kind of a girl but when I looked at this, I was like, oh, I really like that. With this the third one, I did put in contrasting pockets, which no one ever sees. But like I said, with my blue Christmas sweater, I like hidden details, things that people don't see unless they have the skirt. Like, I feel like it's my hidden secret, like my magic power that no one knows I have. <laughs> Um, with this one, I changed how I did my waistband. It's all the same length still, but I played around with the width of it. And so the directions say for, let me get the original mock-up. You're supposed to stitch in the ditch. And so I stitched in that ditch <laughs> for the first skirt. And then I decided to play around with, well, what if, what if you can see my stitches? Like, what if I don't stitch directly in the ditch? What if I like tight rope it? <laughs> and so ever so close to the ditch, but not actually in the ditch. So that's kind of what I played around with at the bottom. And this one, I also put stitching at the top, thinking maybe that could get, help me get a cleaner line. Um, and I also thought maybe that would help the elastic have a clear, like, channel to stay in, but I don't, I don't think it did. This is the only skirt where I did the top, the top row seam. And I also put in... Maybe it was easier to see on this side. But I sewed my elastic on and then 
I tried to do two seams here for the elastic, but I don't think I got all the elastic in correctly. And so I think I'm gonna have to rip out my seam here and I'm gonna need to fix the elastic on this skirt. But I do love the print and I love the pockets. Totally would wear it. And then my next skirt. Oh, I love this fabric. So with this one, again, I played around with the width. I wanted what, okay, so here's what happened. The pattern calls for one and a quarter inch wide elastic. And that's fine and good. And I was able to order some, but then I had an opportunity to go to the craft store, go to Hobby Lobby, and they don't have one and a quarter inch elastic where I was looking and I realized I didn't look in all the places. But regardless, in the place where I was looking, they either had one and a half or one inch. So I went ahead and bought the one and a half, realized one and a half is just not going to work. So I thought, well, I'm not not going to use that elastic. I'm not wasting it, nor am I returning it because I've got, it's just a hassle to return things when you have three small kids. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm gonna keep sewing. I might as well just use it. So this time I made the waistband wider so that it could accommodate the elastic. I still did the double stitching, like the two seams to hold my elastic. So my elastic is in there, it is straight. This woven cotton is not at, it has more movement to it, a little more drape to it than my, I would call the other skirts are a woven cotton, but it's more of like a quilter's cotton and this is more, I don't know, it's just not as thick. It has a better drape to it for sure. And I did modify my panels that make up the skirt. Um, so what I did is whenever I have the fabric laying out and let's say the fold is here and the selvage edge is over here, in the pattern, you're supposed to cut down um, this way for the width of the fabric to make up the skirt. And this time I just didn't do that. <laughs> I cut out two rectangles and however wide my fabric was, that's how wide the panel stayed because I wanted to have less waste after I made the skirt. And this has pockets as well but it's just the same fabric. I did not contrast the fabric. The, um, the animal print skirt is the only one that I used contrasting fabric. And the only reason I didn't do that with this one is because any fabric I would have used, I didn't have it washed and ready and I don't know. But I love this fabric and it feels really nice. It wears really nice. I did do, I did not stitch in the ditch. This time I put, um, my stitches at the bottom and I ended up doing, this was a mistake. Actually, it has two rows of stitching because I accidentally didn't catch the underside. And so I had to go back and I thought, well, I'll make it look like it was supposed to be double stitched. Um, and then all of the skirts, I should say at the hem have double stitching. You probably, I don't know if you can see because of the fabric but my hems at the bottom are getting a lot nicer. I mean, I can see, I notice a difference every time I go to make one and finish one that I'm like, okay, I did a lot better on this. I need to work on this next time, whatever. Um, and then this is the one I finished up yesterday. So we went from like bold and colorful to just kind of a soft, this does have a pattern on it, but the pattern is very subtle. Um, I don't even know that it, if it can pick it up in the camera. I don't know. But I like that from far away, it is just kind of plain. And then when you get closer to it, you can see the difference. Like you can see the pattern to it on the fabric. 
So with this one, with a lighter color, I should have sewn in a lining to go with the skirt, but I didn't. So um, I just have to be very thoughtful about how I wear it. Um, maybe buy a slip to wear underneath it. This has pockets, like I said, all of like all the other skirts, but no contrasting fabric. Something that I did start doing with the other skirts is, I don't know that you can see it on this one. Let me see. You might be able to see it on this skirt. Uh, or maybe not. But where the pockets were, something I decided to do was to stitch along the edge of the pocket to keep the pocket where the pocket is to keep that line neat and clean um, and easier to iron. So that's not in the sewing pattern, but it is a modification that I made. Anything that I can go through and make something a little more crisp or cleaner um, is what I chose to do. I made this skirt exactly like I did. These two skirts were made using the exact same methods. Um, I went a little slower on this one because I knew like I need to slow down when it comes time to put in the elastic and this with this last one. This one and that other skirt that I just showed with it, I think I nailed the elastic portion of it, like I sewed it exactly how I wanted to. Something that I need to work on is getting this front panel sewn on straight. Apparently, when I was um, sewing this, I must have been pulling on the fabric just a little bit too much, and so now the front waistband is not flat and straight like I would want it, but in the end, who cares? I mean, I would, I'm still gonna wear it, I still love it. And I, before this, I had two skirts in my closet. One is like a shorter, it's not really pencil length, but it's fitted um, skirt that doesn't necessarily fit me and I probably need to get rid of it, except I don't wanna get rid of it because I love the fabric of it. So what I could do is use that fabric and make something out of it. And then the second skirt I have is a blue maxi skirt from Old Navy from years ago. And what prompted this skirt making adventure was I was looking for a skirt to wear and I wanted skirts to wear with future sweaters that I'm dreaming of. And I was like, do I really only have two skirts? Cause I wanna, if I wanna tuck in the sweater, I wanna have that option. And I, I have plenty of dresses, but I was like, how do I only have two skirts? Do I, did I need more skirts? Not necessarily, but knowing that I have this one skirt pattern that has the shape that I want and it has pockets, I could basically make any kind of skirt that I could want with this. Um, so I have one more skirt planned for it right now. Actually, if I'm being honest, I've thought about two. So I have some pink fabric that I want to make a dress and I also bought enough to make a skirt and I want to try making some dresses for the girls, like pillowcase dresses, super simple. And then I kind of was inspired by my mock-up version and I kind of want to play around with taking like scrap fabric and just making like a pieced fab like just piecing together fabrics and then cutting out pattern pieces and making a like a patchwork skirt if anything it'll just be fun which I'm totally for that. So that was kind of inspired by this because the back of the skirt and the front of the skirt are completely different, but I like them. So I don't know. Um, I like to take risks with, I can take bolder risks with color and pattern than I can with shape. 
Um, some shapes just don't work for my body. Like as my body is getting older and my skin is losing elasticity and it's changing shape after having kids, my preferences in my clothing have changed. So when I was in my teens and twenties, I liked really like loose, soft, drapey fabrics. And in my thirties, there are some items like I, this is like drapey and soft, but there is some structure to it as far as like how the sleeves are sewn and everything. So as I'm getting older and my body is changing, I am drawn to shapes and fabrics that have a little more structure to them. So then it kind of counterbalances the fact that my body is losing elasticity by giving it structure with the items that I'm wearing. And that's just what I like for me. Um, so that's kind of how I take my risks is with color and pattern. And I try to keep the shapes pretty simple. So that's everything for the second week of March. Clearly lots of skirts. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to need any more skirts for a while, but now I have like a uniform. I can put on a t-shirt, put on a skirt, throw on some shoes. I'm good to go. Like there's no thought about it. And I love that. So my next thought is I have purchased a couple of other patterns in my head. I'm thinking if I could just get like a basic sewing patterns for a skirt, pants, dress, and a top, like a shirt, shirt, pants, skirt, dress. I'm going to throw in overalls because I love me some overalls. If I could just find just five sewing patterns and then I can just use those over and over and over then winner winner chicken dinner like i did with this i would recommend this i do think it was an easy pattern i am still i am still very much a beginner sewer and so not my my skirts are not always perfect and there are things that i need to keep doing to get better so if you're a beginner sewer and you go into this thinking you're gonna make like a perfect skirt I would still say make a mock-up and just practice first before thinking you're making your dream skirt. I've now made four of these. Have I made, how many did I, <laughs> how many did I have? One, two, three, four. Oh my God. Okay. So I've made five of these now and there are still things that I need to work on. So it's just like with knitting, like it just takes practice. I, you know, I've done, I don't know how many thousands of stitches I've done with knitting and I'm getting better and getting better, still not perfect. And it's the same for my sewing. I would ultimately like to be able to have a handmade wardrobe. I'm not going to sacrifice the store-bought clothes that I already have because that's not that's not necessarily helping out in the sustainability uh realm of things. So what I would like to do is kind of make a slow transition from what I'm buying from the store versus what I can make because I like, I like having more choice in my fabrics. That is really fun for me to go and pick out my own fabric and to kind of stick to a silhouette that I know works. And I find more joy in like buying a skirt never made me feel how I felt when I made a skirt. Does that make sense? Like it feels very empowering to know that you have the ability to do this thing before, you know, you would have just gone out and bought whatever, like you're at the mercy of whatever is in fashion at that time, as opposed to something that you actually would really want. Like an example would be like, I'm still on the search for like my dream jeans. And 
like in my head, I know what I want. Like I want kind of a long leg, kind of a mix between like a, a slightly flared, something that's elongating, more of a 70s look, but not a super flare bell bottomy look. Just a soft flare that elongates and slims the legs. And when I just kind of been keeping my eye out for that, all the jeans are cropped. I don't want cropped jeans. I'm 5'10", 5'11", somewhere in there. All jeans are cropped on me. <laughs> I don't need high waters. <laughs> I can just buy regular jeans and have high waters. So I don't know. I'm still just on the hunt for that perfect thing. And I don't like feeling, I don't like the feeling of being at mercy, at the mercy of whoever's deciding what the fashion trends are. I'd rather just go buy the fabric and make what it is that I'm looking for in a fabric that I would like. And to know that I have the skills to do that, it feels very empowering. Does that mean I'm gonna stop buying clothes at Target and Old Navy? No, <laughs> it doesn't, but I kind of just like the idea of going back to a time like when my mom was younger and when my grandmothers were alive and were raising kids and they made they made their clothes because that's just what you did. So not only does it give me like a creative outlet, but it ties me back to like, it just makes me feel closer to my family in a kind of weird convoluted roundabout way. It's like, I don't know. It just makes me feel like when I'm and when I sit down at the sewing machine, it's like I have my mom It's like I have my mom and my grandmothers and my aunts and just all of those women like I have them with me and we're all sewing together. And oh, I think that's part of why I just loved watching Anne with an E while I was sewing because those characters and their small town life, like it reminds me of the women in my family and like the men in my family and just, oh, it's just so good. So anyway. That, that hit me in the feels. That's why I made five skirts in a week. <laughs> so, and if you're curious, Tara, how did you, how did you get all that done with three small children? Well, let me tell you, I cut out the skirt fabric during breakfast time. The kids would be eating and I would do it at the, we have like a peninsula in our kitchen. So I would put out all the, the things that I needed to cut out the fabric. So I would get all my pieces cut out and then at nap time I could go in and sew the skirts together. And just like with anything, the first time you do something, it takes way longer. And then by the fifth skirt, I was like, it was sewing itself. So that's how I was able to get it done with three small kids. So anyway, I think that's, it. I'm done rambling and sharing my heart for the second week of March and we're going to march on into the third week. So for this week I did some knitting but I wasn't able to finish any projects but I did get some bags made. Shocker. So this first one that I made is just leftovers from my skirts. I didn't want to let that fabric go to waste. And so my mission is to use all of my scraps. I made this a tall bucket like bag and I just randomly pieced different scraps together. 
And this one has two zippers, so I've got the green zipper. Oh, there we go. Green zipper in here. And an orange zipper. Orange zipper on the other side. This is where I have all my ball bands stored. And what I've been doing is keeping my stitch markers. There you go. There you can see them. I keep my stitch markers attached to the zipper. This is helping me count decreases for sleeves. So, and I can close it up. So this fits a sweater. There's a sweater in here, a fingering weight sweater. For the straps, I just sewed two pieces of fabric together and with a zigzag stitch down the center and then put fray check on the sides and it'll hold up and then it'll fall apart and then I'll fix it and I just, it's just an experiment. How well is it gonna last? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know until you try. I will happily be the guinea pig. And we have the fabric inside. So I normally just keep the top rolled down while I'm working. I have my pattern and my project nicely inside. Everything fits. So this is like my tall bucket bag. Love that. And then my second bag I made is a larger drawstring bag. This kind of has like a rainbow-ish theme. And I had some straps, so I made it into a book bag, like a backpack kind of a thing. So this will be good if I'm going somewhere and I want to take a project with me because I can wear it as a backpack and my hands will still be free. I'm a huge hands-free bag kind of a girl. It either needs to be crossbody or a backpack, so I have both hands to do whatever it is that I need to do. Okay, so when I open it up, it's quite large. And if I had to make it again, I would have put the drawstring closer to the top, but I didn't, and so it is what it is. This, this also has pockets on it. So on this side, in this pocket, I put a pouch, like a pocket for um, a crochet hook, a pencil, and I think I have a safety pin on here. And then there's also a pocket for my scissors so that my scissors aren't floating around in the pocket because my fear was if I put scissors in here, what if they poke through something? Now that may happen, that may never happen. But just for peace of mind, I put in that pocket. And then in the back, what I did is I just used some fabric. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't really recommend what I did. I just, I don't even know what I did. <laughs> I took fabric, strips of fabric. I sewed two lines and then I turned it kind of halfway inside out, but not completely smooth so that it still has some squish to it. I didn't cut down the seams. I left things pretty thick so that it could stay kind of squishy. And then I just sewed back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> I was like, I don't want this to fall off. <laughs> and then I did the same thing with the bottoms as well. And I just ordered these straps off of Amazon because I didn't quite know what I was gonna do. And so I didn't want to put too much money into it because I didn't want to ruin like anything that was real leather. But there is a pocket back here too, underneath the straps. I put in another pocket and this is the red pocket and the pink fabric, it fits the foot dimensions of my phone. So I can slide my phone in there if I need to and then I don't have to dig around for it. How often will I put my phone in here? I don't know. <laughs> um, the inside fabric is yellow. And in this one, I did use some blue fabric so that this is where I know my pattern goes. I would make this again. I would put 
the drawstring closer to the top and the pattern pocket I sewed in um, going like in portrait. So if I take out my pattern, I sewed, first of all, this is a pet peeve of mine. I didn't want to have to fold my pattern to fit it in there, but I had to. So I sewed the pocket going this way and in another bag, if I do this again, I would sew the pocket so that the pattern fits in this way. So that when you, when I pull the drawstring, it's not going to damage the pattern up at the top. So this can kind of lay closer to the bottom. So I'm going to uh, get on my own nerves, fold this back in half and then put it back in here. But it is, it's a good size pocket even for like if my little notebook if I want to put it in there. So this would be a good traveling bag. And again, I just use leftover fabric from my skirts and fat quarters that I've had for years and years and years. And yeah, I did put for both of these bags, I do have interfacing, fusible interfacing for the fabric on the outside to give it just a little bit more um, stability so that it can, so that it can stand up on its own without getting kind of floppy on the smaller bags. I didn't do that just because they were smaller. And so it was okay if they were just a little bit floppy, but now I know that I have mad respect for feasible interfacing. And also this week, my parents were able to come and visit. And so they brought off some treasures for me and I just, I can't not share them. So the first is, a doily. I made this when I was 10 or 11. My grandmother had started this pattern and she decided, I mean, I had learned enough that she said, okay, you can make it with me. Now this is only the center motif. If I remember correctly, this actually on the sides, it would go kind of more, um, to a triangle on both sides. I only did the center and I got it done fairly quickly. I think I reached this before she did. Like I got to this point in the pattern before she did. I never blocked this or anything. My mom's had this in their kitchen on a china hutch for forever and she finally brought it down for me. So yeah, not bad for like a 10 or 11 year old. I'm sure there are mistakes in there. <laughs> Who cares? She also brought me some of my grandmother's old sewing and craft books. So there's the Simplicity sewing pattern book and it is from, what year is this from? 1954. This would have been the year my mom was born, but this was from my father's mother. So she has her name written up at the top and it's basically like a how-to. Like it's how to sew like um, facts about fabrics. There's all kinds of stuff like this. Fabric terms and preparation, cutting, novelty cutting, pressing, needle and thread guide. So I'm gonna have to sit down and like really look through this best colors for your type, like your hair color. That's funny. I wouldn't follow that now. How to make a skirt. I mean, I, I need to sit down and really go through this. Like they have different, how to do different stitches. This is like invaluable. I don't need a how to sewing book. Now I have one. And then she also brought me a couple of the magazines that my grandmother had. It's called The Work Basket, Home and Needlecraft for Pleasure and Profit. So I have a few of these. Um, I have three from 1952 and then two from 1951. And this is really cool because my grandmother would have been pregnant with my dad and my uncle, they're twins. She would have been pregnant with them when she had these. And that's really cool. That's super cool. So I th believe that this would have all kinds. 
because this says how to knit a classic sweater, crochet a blouse. Um, what else is on here? I think it mainly mostly knit and crochet. I haven't had a chance to really look through them. There's some needlework in here too, like cross stitch stuff, but just these little bitty magazines. I love it. Some quilt. I think there's some quilting in here. So basically any like needle craft. So I'll have to look through those too. So these are definitely treasures. Like, can you believe it? From when she was pregnant with my dad. And then the last treasure that they brought for me <laughs> has nothing to do with knitting or sewing is my old dance jacket from when I was in fifth grade. So in the 90s, which is having a resurgence fashion-wise, um, these nylon jackets were the thing. And guys and girls, everyone, it fits. <laughs> the arms are a little bit short. Actually, the arms are probably perfect length. <gasps> I'm not going to snap it because it's a little snug when I snap it after three babies. My body's not the same, but... we all have things that we just we wanted so bad and if we were fortunate then we were able to get it and this is one of those things I wanted so bad and so I can't remember if I got it for my birthday or for Christmas but my birthday and Christmas are so close together so it's one in the same oh I was just like oh my god I am so cool this is the coolest thing ever <laughs> oh my gosh so I had to put it on. I'm not putting on my old dance costumes that they brought, but this, I freaked out when I saw this. Like I audibly gasped pretty loudly and then promptly put it on and then danced around the house because I just love it. So anyway, this is, oh, I just loved this. I mean, and I figure since the 1990s are pretty much back like scrunchies, grunge, mom short, like jeans, all of that stuff since 90s fashion is now having kind of a resurgence. It's having its like not day in the sun right now. I was like, I could totally wear this and get away with it. <laughs> I'm not going to. I mean, well, I shouldn't say I'm not going to. My um, my give a dang about what other people think is enough for me to wear it and not care what other people think. So anyway. Okay, so now we're ready for works in progress. I am going to jump into the project that I have in my little bag here. This is Something in the Air by Hohe. I've worked on this. I've only knit maybe a couple of rows on this this month. I haven't made a whole bunch of progress, nowhere near the amount of progress that I made in February, but that's okay. I had a lot of other things I was working on. Um, this is two skeins of Gabriella Makes DK in the colorway Cider, I believe, if I remember correctly. I did not um, alternate the skeins as I was knitting this. I ran out of the first skein, jumped into the second one. There is um, a color difference between the two skeins, but since this is gonna be more of an infinity scarf style, once I have it on and if I wrap it around my neck, it's not really gonna be that noticeable. And so, I think it'll be just fine, okay? That's kind of like the beauty of hand-dyed yarn and naturally dyed too. So, and I haven't mentioned this, but something that I do have on here are my progress keepers. I don't know, I'm trying, I don't know how well you can see those. They're small, they're dainty. They're very beautiful. So one of my Instagram knitting friends, Shreya, had 
said she was going to make some for herself and she had tons extras and if anybody would be interested in having them and she would send them to us and I said well I would love to have some and so I really like whenever I work on this that every time I see those I think of her and her sweet family and her beautiful children and so I just, ne I just realized I never mentioned that she had sent those and I wanted to say how much I appreciate that and that I do enjoy them a lot. And I have them on that project, but I also have it on inside my big bag here. Um, I also have it on my, oh my, oh, I'm in the middle of a row. Shame on me. I normally don't do this, but I also have another one on this one. I really like it. It's so, it's very simple and beautiful and dainty and I love it. I haven't really made much progress on this baby blanket. Um, this is kind of where my head is going when we get into April. I have a third whip that I'm working on that I'm kind of like hot and heavy on right now. <laughs> So once I get that done, then I'm going to work on this baby blanket. And um, the blanket that I made before this one, I kept calling the Four Corners blanket. Pearl Soho does have a Four Corners blanket, but that's not the one I made. <laughs> the one I made is the Four Points blanket. And I didn't even realize that I was making that mistake except that a lovely woman had messaged me on Instagram to ask me about that project. And I had to go back into Ravelry and kind of look at some things. And when I pulled up my project page for that, I was like, that's not even, Four Corners isn't even what the project is called. The Four Corners Blanket by Pearl Soho is a completely different blanket. It exists, but it's not the one that I made. I made the four points blanket. So I apologize. If I mentioned it and then you went over to Ravelry and looked up four corners and it never came up, that's because I made the mistake and I'm so sorry. So, like I said, not much progress on that baby blanket, but that will be up next. What I'm hot and heavy into right now is a mohair project. So spring is coming fast. This past week we've had weather in the 60s and the timeline for mohair is kind of ending. But for whatever reason in my mind, I'm like, I need to get this done now. I gotta get mohair done now because I'm doing my Make Nine Mal um, 2021 with Amy from Noble Character Crafts. And I have a pretty good dent in my Make Nine and one of those is mohair. And while it's still kind of chilly, I just want to get the mohair project done. So what I'm doing is I'm using that Starry Night yarn. So this is the shawl that I've mentioned. I think I've only shown it a couple of times. So this is Melanie Berg's On the Spice Market. And what I loved about this shawl, as soon as I saw it, I thought, oh, that could be Starry Night because this is kind of like stars. <laughs> and this fingering weight yarn was a Starry Night Fade by Cornbread and Honey. And after I made the shawl, I had a lot of yarn left over. And so my plan right now is to knit the so faded sweater except not really this is one of those patterns that i've had for a while and have yet to knit and so i'm modifying it because i'm holding the fingering weight with mohair so now it's a dk so i have to do some math and modifications and there's samuel you know, we couldn't do this without him. Okay, so we have a member of our audience live now. He's very excited, yeah. 
So what I'm doing is I'm using one of my favorite store-bought sweaters that I love the fit of, and I'm using that to kind of compare my sweater that I'm working on and trying this on as I go. Um, so I had made Wonder Balls with the leftover yarn. So I'm literally just knitting, knitting, knitting. When one strand runs out, I connect another and I'm holding it double with the Knit Picks Aloft in Celestial. So just their mohair, which is really soft and I don't have any problems with the mohair as of right now. And so I am at the point. Am I on that camera? Okay, Shh. let's be good listeners. So I am just about ready to split for sleeves and it's not really a faded look. I'm not going for like an ombre fade. This is kind of just more of a scrappy fade, I guess. So we shall see how it goes. I'm hoping to have this done maybe like in a week and a half. I'm feeling really motivated to do it because I kind of exhausted myself with all of the Japanese Stitch Bible hats and I don't want to go into um, another project with those kind of stitches just yet. I need a palette cleanser. So, and speaking of Japanese Mom, Stitch Bible, okay, let's be a good listener. Shh. Um, I was watching Tracy and Jody on the Grocery Girl's latest yeah, episode. Shh, let's be good listeners. Huh? On their latest episode where they had um, a kind of a Zoom party, I guess, and they interviewed Amy of La Bien Ami, and they interviewed Andrea oh. Mowry because they're doing their Comfort Fake Cardi Cal. Um, and I love listening to Andrea Mowry talk and teach she knows quite a bit and there's something about her teaching style that's very easy to understand and I just learn a lot from her every time that she um, talks and speaks and one of the questions that Tracy and Jody asked them is that if you were a knitted piece what would you be and I was hey. like well hey, shh, be quiet. Hey, can you wait long. can you no. wait for, hold my hand Will you hold my hand? Oh, thank you. If I was a knitted piece, I knew this right away. Hey, mommy, what do we have? I would be a drop down, a drop sleeve sweater with Japanese stitching in a nude ballerina pink color. And I thought, basically pink fizz. <laughs> if I was a sweater, I would be pink fizz and I would be knit out of Rowan Alpaca Classic. So once I knit that sweater, there I am. That is me. <laughs> so, is there anything else to chit chat about? Oh, I realized I ended up Mommy, last month's me. episode. Hey, hand on me. Hey, can you wait for me? <laughs> you wait for me, okay. I ended last month's episode with talking about podcasts that I love. And I had started talking about Taylor from Fiber for the People, but Samuel called and so I had to leave. And I wanted to finish that up with how much I enjoy her podcasts. And um, I love her color sense. Uh, and she was a former teacher too. That always tugs at my heart. That's an automatic <gasps> peak of my interest. And I didn't realize this until her latest episode where she has like the short little intro clip and then it goes to like some funky music and then she goes into the rest of her podcast and I realized that's kind of what I've done the past couple of videos completely like subconsciously like I didn't even realize <laughs> that the format of video that I had started to slip into is like the format of her video so she is just somebody that I think even um, unintentionally inspires me. So I also just stumbled across um, Knit State of Mind. I just found that podcast yesterday. And so I have started going back and rewatching all of their episodes um, 
two ladies that are educators um, that are knitting. So I'm kind of, I'm really interested to watch their podcast and get to know them better. Um, Cause I think of the podcasts oh, that I like God. to watch. Um, I'm sitting down, I'm watching them and it is kind of like um, a virtual knitting like, I don't want to say retreat, like a get together kind of, you know, only they don't know. <laughs> they don't know that we're having like a knit night, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, you're, a, you're a funny kid. He's under the bed. I don't mind. Okay. So we know when Sam has come. It's near the end and it's time to go play as always. Um, if you have any knitting podcasts that you have really enjoyed that are somewhat new, uh, put those in the comments down below. I like to find new podcasters. I think, I think I've come across the ones that have been around for a while. And so, but if there are any new ones that you think I might like, I would be very interested to watch them and check them out. And, oh, another thing I've been doing while I've been knitting on this Starry Wonder, that's what I'm calling it, Starry Wonder, is now I am re-watching Anne with an E. And I think I'm halfway through season two, the second time around. So I know Joyce said, in maybe two po two or three podcasts ago of hers in Ruby Moss Cottage that she was re-watching Anne with an E. It's just that good. When If you like it, it is just that good. So, are you funny? What are you doing? Um, that's all that I have. Um, if you're interested to know, potty training's going Mama. just fine. My trick for potty training Sam was wait till he's actually ready to do it. Because I learned with my daughter, if they're not ready, then it just causes more stress and anxiety than it needs to. So we're gonna go snuggle and maybe watch some cartoons. It's raining outside, so we can't really go outside to play right now. That's everything and I will see you in April.